charged with introducing these fine gentlemen and, and introducing the topic very briefly. I'll start with the topic and then I'll introduce them and then they'll take it away. Um, so the, the, here we're looking at integrated water management, which is kind of another, an additional layer on some of the planning topics that we've, we've already talked about this morning. Um, when I think about integrated management and uh, the way a, a lot of folks who kind of have got this going in California talk about it um, is about breaking down silos. Um, and the, the idea being that, so I already mentioned to you, you, know, you have your land use agencies are, are separate from your water supply <coughs> agencies. Actually, when you start thinking about water, water agencies, you've got a lot of different types of agencies that are responsible for different aspects of water management. So you've got your water suppliers. Um, they may often be different, actually, from folks who are managing a groundwater basin if they're, if they're managing surface water. So you may have two different kinds of water supply agencies, groundwater and surface water in some cases. Then you've got the folks who are dealing with getting rid of wastewater, your, your wastewater your treatment folks, are, you know, sewer management folks, that's typically a different agency or a separate department within a city government, um, often a special district in parts, of, in parts of California. Then you've got the folks who are in charge of managing the polluted runoff from urban and suburban lands. That is, to, by, by law, it's the responsibility of cities or um, for unincorporated areas of counties but that is typically managed by a separate department. That's often the public works folks within the, the, the city or county. Then you've got your flood management, which is, you know, so the, the, the folks managing sort of the stormwater runoff, that's kind of local drainage management issues too, but then you've got your big flood management. That is often county um, flood agencies. Sometimes there'll be some responsibilities for a city department too. Um, I've got already you know, run out of fingers on one hand already, I think, for that. You often, in addition, have folks who are managing resource-related um, issues in, in relation to sort of open space and habitat. Might be a different, might be a county level, might be a special district. Um, that's all just at the local level, you know, plus your land use folks. Then graphed onto that, you've got state and federal agencies that have regional offices that are that are in charge of regulating a lot of that stuff, or in, in some cases doing stuff on the ground as well. So a lot of different folks doing different pieces of the puzzle, and the idea of integrated uh, water resources management is to try to make some of those connections. Um, and some of it is really just making sure that the folks in, in the towns that are next to each other with different water supply departments, make sure that they talk to each other because there may be projects that by scaling up, it can make sense to do to do together. Certainly with groundwater management, connecting folks geographically makes a lot of sense just for managing the resources. So that's kind of a, a, a scale expansion, but then there's also the sort of uh, function expansion or scope expansion where you want the folks that are doing these different things to talk to each other. And just as one example, um, if, the, if the folks managing water supply and the folks managing wastewater are not working together, you're not going to get a smart use of recycled wastewater um, in, in terms of, of kind of integrating that into your supply. And if they're not also talking to the folks doing the land use side, you're not necessarily going to be connected up with the developers to be able to put the purple pipes in. So that's a sort of background to the, the, the sort of idea of doing this kind of integrated management and California has been really embarked on that, and I think you know Dave is going to give you a little bit more about about how that's been happening in the state. But let me let me start by get, kick this panel off then by telling you who we've got here. We have folks that are are deep into this experiment of really trying to do more integrated water resources management in California. We have one interloper from Sonoma County, <laughs> Jay Jaspers, who works with Sonoma County Water Agency. And then we've got a group of folks who are involved in the Kings River integrated, um, what's the official name of it? Water management. Okay, there you go. Um, and that includes some water guys and some land use guys. So, so Dave uh, from, from, uh, from the water side, and then we've got um, 
Bernard Jimenez from the County of Fresno, and we've got Luke Serpa from the City of Clovis, so they're both more on the you know, municipal and, and, and city and county <coughs> side. And then Eric Osterling, and it's your job to herd cats, right? Pretty much. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so so um, you, you're each going to give us, give us some stuff, and then we'll, we'll open it up for discussion. Great, and I, I know you're all probably exhausted from hearing my voice, so I'm going to give you just a few minutes, uh, three or five, um, on some background here. I think um, IRWMs are kind of that best kept secret in California to some degree. I mean, uh, the, the legislature passed the Integrated Regional Water Management Planning Act in 2002, <coughs> focused on uh, encouraging regional collaboration and investment and to kind of create a self-reliance. And if you think about, you think back to 2002, a lot of discussion about Delta and water supply reliability and storage and moving water from north to south. Sounds like yesterday, um, because it is still uh, part of the discussion. But the, uh, the legislature really put together these tools um, in this act to promote local uh, governance and, and regional planning. That was kind of further supported by the voters' passage of Prop 50 in 2002, um, Prop 84 in 2006, both of which included significant funding and increased requirements for what uh, constitutes a qualified uh, IRWM and, uh, and, and you know, allocated money to specific regions that a lot of the IRWMs have pursued. Important to note, and this is one of the big fond criticisms of IRWMs under the current statutory structure is, you have to be an IRWM to be eligible for money. So has the IRWM been created to truly achieve regional planning, or has it been a, a created just as a, a, a credit vehicle to get money? Um, it, it is uh, widely used in the state. If you look for the um, California Integrated Regional Water Management Planning uh, map, you'll see that virtually the entire state's covered. There are in 2011, there were 49. I suspect there's probably a slightly bigger number today, but they're all over the board in terms of uh, sophistication, governance, uh, objectives, that sort of thing. But it's it's been embraced, um, maybe again because the money's been dangled in front of their noses. Um, it is important to note that IRWMs, or Integrated Regional Water Management, is a foundation of the California state water policy. Um, the California Water Action Plan and Update 2013 is supposed to be released publicly finally either today or tomorrow. Um, builds itself around three basic themes, and those three overarching themes start with integrated water management, and then add to that alignment of agencies, and then investment in infrastructure and innovation. So um, whether we like it or not, IRWMs are there until the legislature and the administration decides that they want to go a different direction. So in terms of the King's Basin, uh, the entity that's one of the sponsors of this event, um, we started an effort uh, back in 2001 through some of the local water agencies um, to discuss with DWR kind of a, a coordinated approach that was further enhanced and clarified by the passage of the act the next year in 2002. We engaged in a multi-year public dialogue through um, some forum discussions that were facilitated with uh, expert uh, facilitation um, and ultimately uh, adopted our first IRWM in 2007, um, which included a vision of sustainable management for the basin, uh, some basic agreements and principle that all the parties said they would adhere to or recognize formed our governance entity in 2009, and then uh, just recently updated the IRWM in 2012. Um, and it's been fairly successful. I mean, if you look at our funding history within the region, um, tens of millions of dollars brought in from both water bond financings and public or private investment. The California Water Foundation is one of our partners uh, to support uh, expansion of data collection methodology, um, the, the development of a model and even uh, a lot of infrastructure on the ground ranging, ranging from metering to uh, groundwater recharge basins to habitat protection. So as we move forward, and just a couple of close
closing comments here. Um, I think the challenges moving forward continue to be achieving balance. You know, we have 53 or more entities that come to the table monthly and talk about what their project priorities are, what their objectives are, and maintaining some balance amongst those interests, particularly with increasing political pressure to look at disadvantaged community drinking water supplies, for example, or to look at sustainable groundwater management is going to create some challenges to the entity. Sustainable funding is always a problem. Um, the organization exists today on just dues contribution from members and a voluntary small payment by um, interested parties uh, to support kind of a basic administration budget. And then I think governance will continue to evolve um, uh, so that members feel that they are truly represented and truly have their stake being represented in, in that process. Benefits, from my perspective, um, the existence of IRWM has established a lead, policy lead in these discussions locally and in the state. Um, you know, people have used the term rock star. You know, that the Kings Basin Water Authority is a rock star in uh, integrated regional water management planning. And it's allowed us to shape a lot of these policies uh, and strategic planning components that DWR has, has used. We also know a lot more about our base than a lot of people around us do. We have quantified what we need to do to get to sustainability. So we have an incredible head start on implementation and compliance with the Groundwater Management Act, or the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act as a result of that. And I think, again, the, the discussions amongst these various you know, used to be siloed interests are, are, are interesting and that we can leverage a lot of common ideas and solutions that benefit all of us. So, thank you. Thank you, Dave. So, as the, uh, as the interloper of the group, um, I brought a map with me so you all know um, where we yeah, where where I'm from and um, so I'll talk just briefly about who we are, what we do, and then just for context, and then I'll talk comment on the um, integrated regional water management plans. We're involved with two regions, uh, and then uh, comment briefly on this the issue here of groundwater management and land use planning. And some of the things we're grappling with, especially with the new legislation. So we are, um, the Sonoma County Water Agency is a special act district, um, and we operate uh, over three counties in the North Bay Area, uh, Sonoma County, Mendocino, and Marin County. Uh, and our board of directors is, are the same five people who are the board of supervisors for Sonoma County. It's a bit unique, um, but it has some advantages, especially in light of the subject that we're talking about today, you know, land use planning and water supply, groundwater management. Um, we basically have four things we do. Uh, we manage wholesale water supply for over 650,000 people. As part of that, we uh, manage the Russian River Basin. We operate two reservoirs in conjunction with the Corps of Engineers, maintaining uh, water supply and minimum in-stream flows. Uh, we also provide flood control services. We manage eight sanitation districts, and we do power generation. So the things that Ellen was talking about, uh, in terms of integrated man water management, uh, the services we provide, um, we're well poised to do that, and we have many programs underway uh, working with partners uh, to really implement regional water management uh, programs. Um, in terms of, I guess the other thing I'll say that really I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't is that for us in water supply, especially with the Russian River Basin, the Endangered Species Act, looms large, we're under biological opinion, and so everything we do, uh, do in terms of water supply planning, including groundwater management, uh, has the um, stamp of the ESA uh, involved. So with that though, in turning to groundwater, um, our, unlike the Kings Basin area, our basins are small, but that doesn't mean that they're not significant. They comprise one of the two major sources of water we have to utilize along with the Russian River system. And so it's been um, one of our overarching goals is to manage that groundwater resource in conjunction with a surface water resource. Um, we've been involved in. 
So these are four of the basins um, that we have been extensively involved with. And um, you can see the Russian River is um, up near the top of those basins. And so we have a, a pipeline system that takes our deliveries to the urban areas in several of these groundwater basins. So you have that connection there. So proactively managing those resources is something we are, uh, have been involved with and continue to be involved with. Uh, but we see many of the typical stressors of our groundwater system that you see here, we see throughout the state. We have areas of groundwater level decline, saline water intrusion. Some of our basins are next to uh, uh, the San Pablo Bay, San Francisco Bay. And we have, um, uh, definitely we have uh, depletion of uh, surface water flows from groundwater pumping too. So these all add to the mix of, uh, of complications. It's led to your classic water fights that we have here and elsewhere in the state. Um, you know, we have uh, several, I think we have the most open water rights issues with the state board in our Russian River watershed. We own that distinct honor. And uh, we have had several rounds of litigation over various groundwater matters. And so it all uh, brings to, you know, the typical confluence of politics and water management. Uh, recently, the, the state board has issued special uh, regulations to the Russian River watershed uh, for agriculture using water as frost protection. There was litigation over that. Uh, the appeals court just came out uh, uh, approving the uh, state board's uh, regulations, and so those will now be implemented to the agricultural community. Uh, those regulations were formulated before the, the groundwater, uh, the new groundwater law, so it'll be very interesting how all that comes together. That's one of the things we're struggling with. In terms of um, integrated regional water management plans, our service area covers two, two plans that are dis very distinct. One is the Bay Area, very urbanized, and the other is the North Coast, which goes from our county in Sonoma all the way up to the Oregon border. Uh, very rural, resource-oriented, and culturally very distinct. If you can imagine, say, Siskiyou County and Sonoma County is a lot of differences politically, culturally between those two areas. So there's been a lot of challenges uh, in terms of bringing folks together and just understanding and learning about each other. Uh, but I think that there has been, in addition to the funding benefits that we realize, um, especially in the North Coast, I think there have been some uh, relationships built. Uh, this is an area where the northern part of that plan uh, there's, there's water diversions from the Eel River system to the Russian River system that are uh, very uh, controversial and has divided that whole region. And I think that the integrated plan has really um, brought water managers, counties together, the polit uh, local politicians to regularly meet and understand each other. And so I think in addition to the funding, we're seeing some, some benefits out of that program. And fin finally, just in terms of um, some of the land use considerations we're grappling with in our county, now I'm talking specifically about Sonoma County. Um, we were one of the first counties to implement a water resources uh, element in our general plan, and that was done about 10 years ago. And that was quite helpful, but I think it's, um, as general plans are, they, you know, they're every 20, 25 years, well, the world's changed a lot since then. And so um, we definitely have some work to do to really sink in our land use planning and our groundwater management planning. Some of the examples that we're grappling with now are a well ordinance. Uh, the county have been working on updating its well ordinance uh, for about 10 years, and they picked, they had a horrible timing. They were going to roll it out this fall, and then along comes the new groundwater legislation, which uh, hit them like a ton of bricks. And so uh, what they're going to do, the county's going to do, is separate out the construction standards and move those forward and then take the thornier issues like what's a ministerial permit versus discretionary permit, uh, well spacing issues, things like that. And they're going to fold that in and we're going to be working on that in our implementation into the new groundwater law. So that's just one example. Another one is a riparian setback policy, which is hotly debated in our neck of the woods um, for uh, dictating or, or managing land use in the riparian corridors and, and development uh, vineyards usually, but not always in our area. And that includes well um, permitting and well pumping, etc. And so that's another area that is going to be reopened now, I think, as part of this groundwater legislation. 
So I think one of the, where we're at now, and I'll just wrap up here, is that our board of directors, which also sits at the board of supervisors, has formed a cross-agency team of work group um, of land use planners and groundwater managers, and we're going to work over the next six months on how distilling the new groundwater legislation, how, what are the key things that we need to do, and uh, providing recommendations on how to move forward, uh, and then doing outreach within the rest of the community, the cities, and, and other stakeholder groups. One of the big um, issues right off the bat we're going to be grappling with is that um, we have many groundwater basins, and we're, with this new Groundwater Act, we're going to have to have uh, groundwater sustainability agencies for at least four different basins, and it could be up to seven, depending on the reprioritization uh, that DWR is going to do. And so how do we do that? Do we have one big agency, or do we have uh, uh, governance at a basin by basin level? So those are just some of the issues we're dealing with. <coughs> Good morning. Um, I will try to provide, a, a, I guess, a, the land use perspective um, as it relates to Fresno County. Um, Fresno County, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, I believe it, it checks in as the sixth largest county in terms of size uh, in California, uh, checking in at a little under 6,000 square miles. Uh, there are 15 cities within Fresno County. They each have their adopted general plans and plan for growth uh, within their spheres of influence and their city limit boundaries. Uh, in the unincorporated area, where the county obviously has land use jurisdiction, uh, there are 10 unincorporated communities. Uh, we have six specific plan areas, and we have four regional plan areas. But predominantly, the, the primary land use in Fresno County is agriculture. And, and like other counties, agriculture in Fresno County is, is basically a buy right use. Um, some of the things that, that we've been working on in terms of, as it relates to Irwin and, and the whole issue of groundwater management resource, uh, Fresno County is working on, uh, as a result of a grant from uh, AB uh, 303, it's, it's basically looking at studying the area north and, um, north and east of the Fresno Clovis metropolitan area and looking at um, ideal areas for recharge opportunities. Uh, we're in the midst of, of wrapping up that study. We'll be rolling it out later this year and into next year. And I think that will begin to set the, the groundwork for where the county looks at strategically, at least in that region, where are optimum areas for, for recharge opportunities. Um, Alan kind of teed up the whole land use process and, and generally how it works. Uh, you know, by design, the, the, uh, the planning and environmental review process in California uh, is a very public process. Um, you know, you're required to, to provide notification, you provide a whole public hearings, and so, so there is opportunities for the public to engage in that development review process. Um, there's also statutory requirements when agencies are looking at uh, approving projects uh, including the need, the need to consult with water agencies, um, the, and I think Alan referenced um, legislation that requires that the subdivision is, is 500 units or more, we need to prepare um, a water supply assessment plan. Uh, so all those things are in place, and, and uh, in terms of the relationship of land use planning to the Irwin process, uh, you know, I've been personally involved with that over the last four to five years, and really what it's, what it's provided is an opportunity to come together and bring together a number of different de disciplines uh, in really a collaborative, and, and I really got to compliment Dave for his efforts in this process, but really providing a forum for collaboration and discussion amongst uh, different viewpoints. Uh, certainly I bring a land use perspective, but I'm at the table with others that have uh, multiple perspectives, and it's really been a great opportunity to talk about issues of mutual interest. And um, so from that standpoint, uh, it's really been beneficial. Uh, one, of the, one of the challenges that I see going forward uh, is this new legislation that's been um, um, uh, put into law. But it, it really, if you look at the state of California over the last 10 years, it's very similar to other things that have occurred, um, specifically with, with the uh, passage of AB 32 and SB 375, bringing together the transportation and land use, uh, bringing those together in the regional transportation planning process, uh, recently, Fresno County just went through, along with the 15 cities, uh, its RTP process and the sustainable community strategy. So you, you see the convergence of a number of disciplines, transportation, air quality, land use, and now I think the logical extension is, is water, uh, which is obviously a key component to land use decisions. Um, one of the challenges I see with that, however, 
is, is well, there is a mandate now to deal with this issue. We still continue to have to address the mandates um, by the state of planning for growth within our counties and within the cities. Um, we recently went through the regional, uh, regional housing needs uh, plan locally, and basically the state assigns a number of units that, you, that each jurisdiction shall plan for, and that gets distributed amongst the jurisdictions. So, so it's going to be interesting to see how we balance uh, the mandate for planning for growth along with the mandate to achieve sustainability with respect to groundwater. And, and I think those are some of the issues that we're going to need to flush out as we go forward. Um, but I, I think the, the ERWIC process and the authority has provided a kind of a framework for bringing the various disciplines together and, and beginning that dialogue. So uh, it will be a challenge, but certainly something that we will obviously have to address. Okay, uh, my department um, is the, operates and maintains the water system for the city of Clovis. And uh, the city of Clovis just finished its uh, dribble plan update process. So I want to talk a little bit about how we tied our regional water planning efforts into our land use planning efforts. And it's a different department that is the lead on the general plan update as our planning and development services, but we work closely with them. And really what we used is our urban water management plan is kind of the primary link between the Irwin and our general plan. Um, the regional water management plan uh, was developed using some information from our urban water management plan. And our urban water management plan coincides and is consistent with the regional plan and, and trying to achieve those same goals. We take that plan and then the information from our urban water management plan was heavily relied upon um, on the water resources side of the general plan update process. And likewise, we use information from the general plan to update our urban water management plan. So that urban water management plan is really a key link between our regional efforts and our local efforts. And we were able to uh, include in the general plan some really good policies that are consistent with our regional plan, uh, groundwater sustainability being one, um, need to show an adequate and sustainable water supply before development occurs is another. Uh, recycled water is uh, a portion or it's addressed in our regional plan, it's addressed in our urban water management plan, and it's assured through some policies in our general plan. So that, that, was, that was a very good way to tie our general plan to our regional water plan. Uh, you know, there's always room for improvement, but I think it worked pretty well. Um, but those are only plans. And, and now that the plan has been updated, uh, we are in the process of moving forward to the next step, which is um, you know, drilling down to specific plans, uh, updating our utility plans to address the, the new general plan to make sure we have the infrastructure planned out uh, and the supplies planned out. Because a big part of our urban water management <coughs> planning is the water balance. You know, how much water do we have? How much do we need? Uh, so as we move forward with our new general plan, we need to reassess how much we have, how much we need, or how much we're going to need, and our utility master plans will reflect that, how we're gonna, where we're gonna get it, how we're gonna treat it, how we're gonna get it to them. And then once that's in place, you know, the last step is then you move forward from the planning to the doing phase. Um, and we have implemented several programs and policies in Clovis to help us achieve that. Uh, we have a recycled water plant. We, we treat our wastewater and recycle it. The journal plan requires that purple pipe infrastructure go in where feasible the new development. Um, that, that offsets some of our need for surface water. Uh, we, we, have a, a, we have partnered with FID, Fresno Irrigation District, um, on some water banking facilities. We have portions of the city that are outside of FID, so they don't come to the surface water entitlement. So we've partnered with them on water banking um, facilities to provide a source for those uh, areas of development, or even areas within FID, we, what we look at is on a purely residential number, if you're less than two units per acre, um, you're probably going to be using more than your FID allotment for that land because there's so much outside irrigation when you have large lots like that. Likewise, when you start getting much up above 10 units per acre, you're probably going to use more than your FID allotment for that area of development um, because of the intensified water use. Uh, there's also some industrial uses that might use more that we look at individually, but we have a fee structure implemented where uh, in those cases, if you're using more water than the allotment or you're developing outside of FID, 
um, you can, the developer said an additional impact fee that is in what pays for our water basin investment. So um, it really is, the, 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 and all that's addressed in our urban water management plan, um, which really ties the link in between the regional planning and the actual land use. And uh, you know we're in the process of starting to implement that. Um, looking forward to how the city's going to grow. Uh, part of the problem is, you know, we're looking out at the city, you know, we know how much it's going to grow in the next 20, 25 years, but when you start looking 100 years out, things get a little grayer and fuzzier, and, and we're not there yet, but we're working in that direction. So my role was described as um, herding cats, and that's not all I do. Um, one of the other things that I'm in charge of is trying to um, add value to the, to the Irwin and its stakeholders. And an, an IRWM plan is, is a plan of plans, and that doesn't really mean that it's, it's an inventory of plans. The challenge in producing any effective IRWIMP is that you need to integrate all of those plans, and there are a lot of them. Um, each of them come from a different perspective and have uh, different objectives, and, and so uh, stitching together is a challenge. And once you do that, I think that it's a very unique tool for a region um, if done correctly, and, and that it can be um, a very uh, useful thing to refer to in any kind of development of water resources related projects and uh, moving forward in that respect. Um, one of the things that, that I want to talk to you about is the, the tools that are developed. Um, you know, IRWIMPs are seen by some, as, and, and in some cases it's, it's rightfully so, as, as just um, kind of a shell organization in order to go after grant funds to implement projects that are really kind of your own pet projects. But, um, at least within our RWIMP, and I know that other RWIMPs are coming along too, and, and it was mentioned by Dave and others um, earlier on that um, RWIMPs throughout the state, there are approximately 50 of them are developing at uh, different rates. Um, some are um, brand new, and some like the Kings Basin Authority have been around for a decade or more. Um, we, because we've been around for a lot longer, we've had more time to develop some of those tools. Uh, the IRWIMP, um, which was uh, cobbled together from, from a number of different plans, but we also produced uh, um, original documents in that process, uh, a lot of technical memoranda. Uh, we had to sit down and, and figure out what our goals and objectives were. We had to um, decide um, what our challenges were in this region, which you know, not everybody agrees upon. Um, in, in our region, groundwater overdraft is a huge concern, obviously, and so is uh, drinking water quality, um, environmental habitat, and the list goes on. So in, in order to develop tools that were uh, going to be useful to all of our interests, um, or at least that was the, the hope, um, the first thing that we needed to do was um, to prepare a number of different studies. So after compiling all the various existing plans, um, we were able to um, analyze what we had available already and, and then identify those gaps. You know, what did we need to know that we don't already know? And so we were able to take that and scope out um, various planning documents and other tools that we then sought uh, private and, and state grant funding to produce. Um, we've since uh, produced a disadvantaged community pilot study. That study sought to, first of all, inventory what our disadvantaged communities um, were, or the, the number of them, their locations, and then also what their challenges were. But then furthermore, to engage those disadvantaged communities and try to bring them to the table to um, inform them that, hey, there is this IRWM process. It, it brings together a diverse group of stakeholders in this region to talk about our challenges. Um, more than just to have a, a forum to complain about your own challenge, it, I, I see it as an opportunity to educate others and then also be informed <coughs> yourself. Um, and that is one reason that actually, at least within our work, we have a standing agenda item for our members and interested parties to provide occasional presentations to inform other stakeholders in the group on, on what their organization is, um, what's, what are some of the projects that they're working on. And so that goes back to the relationships. Over time, it, you, know, it, you, you develop these relationships, you develop that trust. Um, uh, most of the business conducted in our room, I think, actually occurs before and after the meetings. So those conversations that you have on your way out, um, you, you, you picked up on something from somebody um, saying, um, reporting on, on something of interest, and, and then that develops into these partnerships where you truly do integrate your approaches to your projects and you look at things from more of a, a regional impact as opposed to planning within your own silo. We, we also have gone, uh, come a long way in our data management. Um, as an IRWIM, we don't really own or produce a whole lot of our own data. We produce end products with, uh, with that data. Um, so we rely on our stakeholders for the, the information that we need in order to prepare uh, tools that are useful to the region. 
Um, and then once we do produce those tools, they, they're either, uh, the, whether they be maps or actual models, we, um, we, we house them and if appropriate, we make them publicly available um, to the planning community and the general public at large to access and to review and, and then make their own decision making. So the, the Irwins aren't a, an organization or, or, a, or an, uh, it's not a concept that overrides any local jurisdictions or state or federal jurisdictions. It's really more of just a, a way to provide a tool to allow those jurisdictions to make their own decisions. And, and then in the end, even activities like this, I think are very helpful to getting that message out, uh, workshops and other opportunities for networking. Um, you know, the Irwips, I think, need to be recognized within a region in order to be truly effective. I mean, as, as water managers, um, you know, we can, we can all know about this little secret as Dave, you know, described it, but um, it doesn't really do us any good if those people who are really helping to make the decisions, the land use planners, but then also the electeds and the general public, um, if, if they don't recognize IRWIMPS as, um, as something that can be used and that is a value to the region, then, um, then those tools and, and that resource won't be used and, uh, and they'll, they'll be largely wasted. So we just have a few minutes, and instead of me asking these guys, just open up to the floor, I think, if we have time for a, a couple quick questions. And these are directed in general to the group. Uh, with regards to higher end plans, uh, there's, there's only limited capacity for a lot of interest groups to participate. Some don't have the resources, the expertise, or the budget to participate. DACs, as you folks know already. What do you do to incorporate those folks in your planning process? That's my first question in terms of outreach and, and actively engaging them to make sure that their interests and their priorities are reflected. Uh, secondly, I, I didn't hear any mention so far of, of, of Indian tribes. I mean, we have both federally recognized tribes and, and, and state recognized tribes. And then third, uh, IRWMs for the last 10 years plus have been fairly uh, provincial, and by the, I don't mean that in a disparaging way, but they've, but they've stayed inside their boundaries, especially after DWR did their regional acceptance process and said this is your boundary. It seems that the next step for IRWMs has to become in a region. This is where it has to that, That's a question to you. Do you see that in your regions as well? Thank you. I guess I'll take the first shot at that um, and answer your last question first. Uh, as an agency that spans two different Irwins, uh, we definitely see the need of that interregional collaboration. Um, and so that's something we definitely would like, like to encourage and, and promote. Um, in terms of tribal issues, uh, the North Coast Irwin plan, um, there's a definite significant presence um, by the tribes in terms of um, participation and in the governance structure of that program and they've received some funding too uh, from this program. Um, in the Bay Area it's more urbanized. Uh, we have struggled with getting, making sure that the NGOs have a place at the table and the DACs are represented um, and it continues to be a struggle. Um, we've separated into planning groups and policy groups for environmental and flood control and etc. Um, you know, disciplines like that. And we um, have there's uh, protocols that have been developed where we make sure that we try to get more balanced representation. It, it can tend to be water agency dominated uh, because the water agencies have the most resources and they're plugged into obviously. Uh, water management and so there's a it's a continuing effort I think there um, across both plans um, it's it's an active area for improvement especially in the Bay Area plan. Uh, two things the, the interregional approach um, we actually do have in the Tulare Lake hydrologic region which is that area from the San Joaquin River down to the Hatchbees and coastal range to um, the foot of the Sierras a Tulare Lake Hydrologic Region Coordination Group that brings all of the IRWMs um, together regularly and, and Eric represents the Kings Basin Water Authority in that effort to 
really kind of share information. I don't know that there's been a lot of cross collaboration on projects per se, other than you know just kind of a general awareness. Um, the um, the challenge here in my mind is uh, that the state of evolution of, of or development, if you will, of the IRWMs within that hydrologic region kind of creates a hierarchy. And um, it's difficult, just to be real honest, for somebody like the Kings to want to get linked to somebody who's got 10 years less history than we do in developing thoughts and ideas and governance. And you know, we want to help, but we don't want to be pulled back, if you will, or diluted because we become too big. It's kind of a diseconomies of scale thing. Uh, but I think there's going to be a, a second bite at that apple because of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and its requirements that we consider interrelationships between groundwater basins and also, to your other point, to consider the interests of the other stakeholders in the groundwater use structure and accommodate them in the development of an agency and a plan. It remains to be seen what that's going to look like. With specific respect to the DACs, it's been a, the disadvantaged community element has been a big challenge for us because, as Eric pointed out, we have over 100 in the Kings Basin. And most, if not all of them, lack sufficient capacity in terms of finance or human resource to participate in our planning processes. And so we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to accommodate them. We have an advisory committee structure that allows anybody to, with an interest in integrated planning to come into that room and provide input and advice uh, to, to the board that ultimately makes decisions. We've explored different um, fee structures to create deep discounts for the smaller communities and even the disadvantaged communities to, um, to participate financially in the effort. And you know, there's a pathway to allow them to actually sit on the governing body by, you know, through a, a public community services district, um, you know, collecting the discounted funds necessary to do structure to, to join in. And we haven't found the sweet spot for that to happen yet, but we're spending a lot of time trying to accommodate that, that restriction in capacity. We've, we've talked about, um, and, and the water bond fails to do this, um, the need to specifically fund the administrative burden of IRWMs. If it's a framework of California water policy, then we need to think about how the state can support that basic structure to allow the stakeholders to come in. Um, right now, trying to pay for it out of our own pockets creates some, some inefficiencies that we're trying to deal with. out of the, the official uh, room and we're going to head over to lunch. <laughs>